Hi everybody, my name is Richard Seilitz from redpants.lol and today I am joined by James Hawksery. Well, technically, I'm joining him because I am at his shop, Aston Installations, in Tewkesbury, England. We are here to film some videos showing what his products can do and how to install them. Before you begin, make sure you check the written instructions for these guides. There are a lot of intricate pieces involved and having the instructions is going to make this a lot easier. This video and a supplementary video for the DB9 are going to show the things that you need to know in advance, but while doing the job, make sure you refer to those actual written instructions. James and I are gonna get started. The main wiring loom starts off at the SEM, that is the cabin fuse box, which is on the passenger side of the car. We're in a right-hand drive car right now, so it's on the passenger side, it's on the left. In an American car, it's gonna be on the opposite side because this would be the driver's side. The wiring harness plugs into a few of the fuses and then has to come back out down the car. It's going to go up and over. In both cars, right-hand drive and left-hand drive, there's an opening down here to go from the back side where all the wires and everything are to run along what basically is a transmission tunnel, even though the transmission isn't there. For the right-hand drive cars, the loom has to cross up and over to get into this spot. For left-hand drive cars, we're already on this side of the car, so it just comes straight up and in, and it's actually a lot easier. The loom then just comes down along and comes out right here. This is it, and it keeps going back all the way through here and around behind this panel. Now, this panel comes out with a couple of clips, which we've already removed, and I'll show you that here in a minute. But once this panel is removed, you can see that the loom keeps going up. Through here, there's an opening that goes to the trunk, the boot, if you will, of the car. The first thing to do to remove this panel is pop out the lens cover for the bulb. It actually includes the bulb itself uh, for the trunk area. Uh, you can use a tiny flathead screwdriver if you're very careful or a trim tool which is more ideal because it'll be plastic and it won't mar anything. With this out of the way, the opening has either an 8 or a 10 mil. It's underneath. It's, um, you can feel it because you're pulling the lens cover out. Uh, it depends on which car you have, what age it is, so it could be a couple different ones. You'll have to try. It's either 8 or 10 millimeter. With that out, you can pull this down to release it and then there's a fir tree clip right up here that you can use your fingers to release and then work the whole panel out, like so. And now we have this panel right here exposed as well. This just comes out, it goes underneath here with this bolt cover being taken out. This can lift up and this panel can be removed entirely. And here we can see where our wiring harness, the loom that we had installed in the front, runs up and out through here, and this is where it terminates, and this is where we're gonna start connecting some components. To get the video from the cameras and CarPlay onto the factory navigation screen, we need to add an RGB interface. This is going to connect into where the nav module is. To get the nav module out, there are three 10 millimeter bolts. There's one on the bottom right here, and there's two on top. There is a trick to getting this out. Once you've removed those three 10 millimeter bolts, you need to bring it out a bit and then push down here. It's easy if you have this carpet out of the way, you can fold it out if you need to, but basically this needs to be pushed down so that this top piece right here, this bracket, can clear the trunk release solenoid that is right above it. With that out, you can pull it out and disconnect the connections from the back. Here you can see the three places where those bolts are, right here. On the back, you've got some connectors, and this is where we're gonna tie in. If you have a Roadster, the process is a little bit different to connect to the nav module because it's in a different location. For the Volvo based systems, the nav unit is right here inside of this. To get to it, you need to open up the roof partway and then prop it open. To do that, just hold the button until it's about partway open and then release. Technically, this is a malfunction. The roof will then the roof cover at least, the tonneau cover, will then start to sink back down. You need to prop it up and then it will sit there under its own weight on those props. Be extremely careful when you do this. You wanna make sure that your props are secure because you don't want this closing on you. You don't want those props jumping out and hitting anything, scratching your paint or anything else. So be very careful. If in doubt, don't attempt this. 
At the end of this process, to get the roof to work again, all you have to do is take your props out, let it settle under its own weight, and then let the car sit, key out of the ignition by itself for about five minutes, a little bit longer, and then it should reset itself to start working again. So while this is the location for the nav module for the uh, Volvo-based navigation system, the Garmin system is actually down here beneath the seat. You can see this connection that we have. These two plugs were originally connected together. We disconnect those and we insert our Aston installation supplied harness right here, which will then give us the connections we need to use instead of what we showed in the Volvo-based coupe. On the back here, this is going to be the connector where we tie in our RGB interface. You're gonna disconnect it and add in one of Aston Installation's own looms. It's gonna to connect to it and then reconnect to the other side, basically adding this tail end here, which is going to then connect to our interface like so. In order to get the RGB interface to work, we need to connect it. What we did before was plug in the video end to send the video signal to the car. However, we need to put all the inputs, including power and everything else, all the video components going into this box. The wiring harness is supplied as well. It connects in, I guess it goes that way if we wanna be really specific while we're sitting here. And on the other end of that, we have multiple leads. Now each of these is unique to the connectors that can potentially go into it, except for these two. Green is for the rear camera, yellow is for the front camera. If you switch them up, it's gonna get very weird very quickly, but at least you'll know what you did wrong when you turn on that screen. We also have a toggle switch input. Basically, up front, if you have um, multiple inputs, as you press this button, it will cycle through them. So it'll go from the navigation screen, the factory navigation screen, press it, it'll go to your front camera if you have that. Press it again, it'll go to your car plate if you have that. It depends on which options you have, but this button will toggle through each of them as a cycle. We also have our actual power input which will make that interface box work. When adding CarPlay, we need to add in an extra bit of the fiber optic loom that is already in the car. There's a fiber optic circuit that runs around the whole car itself, which is one of the causes of gremlins. So when we do this, we have to be very careful. Never bend a fiber optic cable because it will break the glass inside and then it will stop working. Bit of warning there. It's also a quick place to troubleshoot when you are changing anything with a fiber optic cable. If something's not coming through on the other end, it just comes up blank, it may be the fiber optics. So we're gonna be disconnecting the factory fiber optic connection, adding in a bit more so that we can connect to a fiber optic aux import box, which has connections that go to our CarPlay module and also to our new loom that we just ran through the center of the car. Down here we have our front camera. On this car, because we have a slimline plate that hangs down a bit, we have it mounted on the bottom. On most cars, the best bet is to mount it hanging from the middle section of the front bumper fascia. It's easier to control a bit, and it's actually perfectly safe, even though it's held in place by double-sided tape. I was a bit worried about this on my cars, but having really abused mine and driven it through ridiculous amounts of heat and rain and everything else that is beating upon it, the elements have not changed it whatsoever and is still functioning perfectly, even with all the daily driving in terrible conditions that I do with my gray Aston. From here, either place that you put it, the main lead from the camera is going to go up, up through here and come along to right around here. At this point, we are gonna be using an extension, which is part of another harness. This is where that camera lead plugs in, and we're gonna be running the wire up through here. It's gonna go down and drop into a hole, which you need to punch in through the grommet that goes through the firewall right there. On the other end of that is all of this. So this is the wire that's gonna be going through the grommet, and eventually you're gonna have this bit of more wires, this whole job, more wires, is going to be under the armrest in the car and we'll show you that right now. Here we have the harness that we started off with at the front camera. We have the video input that's gonna to go to the rear of the car. To reach the rear of the car, an extension is provided as part of this kit. That's gonna be run along the car, along with that central loom that we installed at the very beginning. That's gonna detail that and go to the rear where we showed how to plug in earlier. 
we have three, excuse me, four green wires. Two of them will be capped off and not used. The other two will be for the buttons that are up front that control the input modes for the front camera. We also have the power supply, which is the red and black pair. As you can see, we already have this kit installed here. Here's the two for the power right there. And here are the ones for the buttons. They just tuck down nice and easily. Inside the cabin, we have a couple of switches to place. The first one is going to be the CarPlay controller, which we have located right here. The lead for it is pressed in between the bottom and the side of this little cubby. To get to that, all you have to do is take out this panel, which is gonna be out anyway for this installation. Underneath are some screws that you then release so that this bottom piece disconnects. You put the lead through and then you bolt it back together with it just pressed through. There's a sticky pad on the backside, some double-sided tape, so it just gets pushed into place and then it will stay nice and secure and it's not gonna move around. Inside of here, we have a couple more switches. This one and this one are also stick-on and again are pressed through the bottom of the, uh, the cubby. This one has been drilled into, a hole has been drilled in so this one can be located. However, there is the option to locate a toggle switch down here in between the leather and the carpet so that you can just reach under and toggle it without having to worry about any kind of drilling if you don't want to do that. These switches are used to control audio input between the factory stereo system and CarPlay. This one is used for toggling the mode of front camera. So you can do a fisheye wide angle lens, you can do a straight forward, you can do a straight down, and you can do a side to side. And this one here is that mode selector that switches between the input that is being shown on your factory navigation screen. So when you, when you have factory navigation on the screen and you press it, it will go to CarPlay or front camera. When you put the car in reverse, as a side note, when you put the car in reverse, it will automatically override any input that is being used. Once the car is out of reverse, it will revert back to whatever setting you had it in before putting the car in reverse. So there you have it. That's how you install the products from Aston Installations. There's a lot involved and a lot can go wrong if you don't do it right. So if you're not comfortable with this job, please consult a professional. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to either Aston Installations or Red Pants. We're here to help and we're happy to do so. All the products that you've seen are available from both of us. No matter where you are in the world, we are ready to ship them out to get to you. And if you have a DB9, please check the extra video that goes along with this one that has some additional information specific to those cars. Thank you, James, for taking care of us, and we are looking forward to seeing you guys again soon.